And welcome. We have a wonderful program for you today. My name is Betty Cruz and I'm the president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. Our mission is to convene and connect people around, the, around global issues to build a thriving, competitive and inclusive Pittsburgh. And our vision is for a globally minded and globally connected world that is equitable and just for all. 2021 marks the council's 90th birthday. So please be sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our newsletter to learn about the ways we're going to be celebrating later this year. Now for today's program, we're so excited that this is uh, the kickoff to our human rights series. The Human Rights Series will address national and international stories and topics that focus on relevant human rights conversations happening around the world, including events surrounding the human rights successes, violations, and issues most important to our time. We will be rolling out four other series throughout the year in addition to the Human Rights Series. The others are going to focus on resiliency, youth, immigration, and governance and diplomacy. Our resiliency series is going to kick off next month with an Earth Day program featuring Jeff Sachs, who is a world-renowned economist, uh, economist best-selling author and innovative educator and global leader in sustainable development. So please mark your calendars now for our April 22nd program at 1130 Eastern. Now let's get into today's program on international women's rights in the Arab region. In addition to kicking off our human rights series, today's program is also in recognition of Women's History Month, uh, coming to an end here with uh, this special, special talk, and also recognizing International Women's Day, which took place earlier this month. I wanna thank our partners who make uh, events like this possible. Uh, we, for this program, partnered with the Gender Equity Commission of the City of Pittsburgh, the Women and Girls Foundation, and the American Middle East Institute. We are so thrilled to welcome Dr. Lena Abirafi as the keynote speaker for this event. Dr. Abirafi is a global women's rights expert with decades of experience worldwide. Following her remarks, I'll let her introduce all that she has done as she, as she gets into her, her keynote. And following her remarks, we will open the floor to questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you're joining us via Zoom, if you're joining us via Facebook Live, please add comments and we'll make sure to get those questions in the pool um, as, we, as we go through the Q&A with uh, Dr. Abby Rafi. We wanna make sure the conversation is as interactive um, as possible. Now, before we get into uh, Dr. Abby Rafi's responses and remarks, I should say, I'm really excited to start the program hearing from Samu Shawish. She's a sophomore at Fredericton High School in Canada. Uh, she will be presenting her spoken word poem titled Color Palette, which she first wrote in 2019, talking about her experiences dealing with prejudice and Islamophobia growing up in her hometown. Not only has Samu competed with this poem, but she has also performed it at the 2019 Global Minds um, Camp, which is actually when I first heard, uh, when I first met Samu and heard her perform and was completely awestruck, moved by her words. So it's my uh, honor to welcome her here today. And uh, as many of you may know already, we had the privilege of merging with Global Minds last year at the, at the very end of December uh, 31st, 2020. And Global Minds is now a premier leading youth program at the World Affairs Council. So this opportunity to connect with Sumu and hear her words and bring this to you in today's program is just a real honor. Sumu, please take it away. When I was younger, the world was made up of the primaries, red, yellow, and blue. When I was in the second grade, one of my best friends at the time came up to me with skeptical eyes and asked, are you Muslim? I nodded my head, my heart palpitating, beat after beat, boom, 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 begging, oh, pretty, pretty, please, that she wouldn't look at me the way the kids on the monkey bars do when my mom would come and pick me up after school. She didn't talk to me the next day and we haven't talked since. I felt red. When I was in the third grade, a group of girls were hanging out by the fire pole going down one by one, pretending to be like Rapunzel. I slowly approached them, my braids swinging side to side, my fingers intertwined, twiddling my thumbs, and asked if I could give it a try. Mockingly, they asked if my hair was even real, trying to seal some non-existent deal of friendship. I told them that it was, just like my mama's. 
with eyes as cold as ice. They told me the only reason why my mom wore that stupid scarf on her head was because of the bird's nest that laid under it and I melt. I felt blue. Colors flashed before my eyes, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. As I grew older, red and blue were no longer the only colors the cones in my eyes could detect. They would reflect and reflect and reflect back and forth, colliding together like a pure violet, in, pure violet interactive globe, pure violet intergalactic supernova. I couldn't hide behind and describe feelings as colors with only one syllable anymore. I couldn't. I couldn't block out comments like terrorists go back to your country sandbag. They say times have changed, yet terrorist attacks carried out by Muslims receive an average of 357% more media coverage than those carried out by any other group. They say times have changed. When I was 13, just in the last few weeks, a shooter walks into a mosque, a religious place of worship for Muslims. A 71-year-old man from Afghanistan reaches out his hand to greet him, not knowing that would be the last time his frail fingers felt. Hello, brother, he says. The shooter then pulls out his gun. It's two against one. And in a flash, there's a splash of red. The man falls down dead, his hand still grasping out. Now for the air, he could no longer breathe. Another man falls. Over 50 dead, and it's not the first time. They say times have changed. Loden fire breaking news. Mosque shooting in Norway. 77 dead. Loden fire breaking news. 12 dead in Quebec. They say times have changed. Colors flash before my eyes, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Colors flash before my eyes, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, collide. They say times have changed, yet sometimes I wish I could go back to the days of the primaries and see. Um, sorry for a couple of stutters. But I just want to say thank you to Olivia and Suad and Betty for reaching out and giving me the opportunity to share something that means a lot to me. I wish we could do this in person, but you know. Um, but yeah, I just want to say thank you. And now I'm super excited to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Lena Abirafi. Lena, the floor is yours. Wow. <laughs> what does one say after that? Uh, Sumu, I have chills. I, you know, I can't see the faces of the people in this audience who are listening in, but I can feel the weight of their silence because I think we're all stunned and overwhelmed and in admiration of your power and your courage and your voice. And thank you so much for using it. Uh, you are a tough act to follow. Uh, I love this. I love that um, this, this, this opening was so powerful and strong and coming from the heart. I mean, I think that speaks to so much of what this work is. Um, so my name is Lina Abirafe. I've been working for several decades on women's rights. And sometimes I think, you know, these sermons that I give you are not half as powerful as something um, uh, like spoken word that we just heard. But we are here to talk about global women's rights. We're talking about the Arab region. We're talking about this in the context of International Women's Day. Um, we are bringing to light, hopefully, the experience that I have um, working for two decades in humanitarian emergencies, trying to end sexual violence um, and not succeeding, in fact, because sexual violence still continues uh, stronger than ever, just about everywhere. And then working for the last six years as the executive director of the Arab Institute for Women, which is a dynamic regional institute that is both academic and, and activist covering the 22 Arab states. Uh, so a really interesting career change from the humanitarian front lines to the academics, so-called ivory tower, um, but still doing the same type of work dedicated forever and ever to women's rights and to achieving them in my lifetime, which brings me to so-called International Women's Day, International Women's Week, International Women's History Month, however you want to frame it. Um, a little bit of a history lesson because not everybody knows. This day was started in 1911. And that was when women and men also actually took to the streets to demand their rights to work, to vote, to hold public office. And lo and behold, we are 110 years later and we're still making very similar demands. So progress is is scant and is slow um and this is probably the most frustrating line of work that i can imagine being in and i want to give us some global context 
because we need to understand what the world looks like for women now. We can't change what we can't see and we can't fight what we don't understand. And for me, and I think that once we see these things and once I see them, once we talk about them, we can never unsee them. Um, so once those eyes are open, um, I think that leads to some meaningful change. So here are some of the sobering realities uh, for women around the world. Uh, we know for a fact that women and girls worldwide still aren't able to participate fully in all aspects of life, in aspects of social, economic, political, public life, whatever it is. Women and girls categorically have less choice, they have less voice, and the irony is that we are all, as women, burdened with uh, the role of rectifying this kind of imbalance. So even doing equality is seen as women's work. So, you know, here we are. Um, but the fact is that gender equality is not negotiable. It is something that we should all be striving for. It is better for all of us. It is a human rights principle, and it is a precondition for any kind of safe, just, sustainable future, uh, the kind of future that we all deserve. But here we are. The reality is that not one single country in the world has achieved equality, not a single one, not even Iceland, everyone likes to tell me Iceland and it's small splendor, even Iceland is not really equal. Uh, and at the current pace that we're going globally, we need about 100 years to close the gender gap. So I asked myself, you know, will I be alive to see that? And I think my chances are not good. I don't know about you all and your plans for uh, your lifespan, but I really would like us to hurry up. I'm going to go through some of the different sectors so you really get a sense of how pervasive this inequality is. I mean, I can tell you 100 years, and that sounds like an astronomical number, but when we break it down, in terms of education, actually, this is the one that may be a happier story because that's got the smallest gap. The education gap needs about 12 years to close. So that's good news. And we've made lots of strides in terms of girls' education. But in the end, the majority of children who are out of school are still girls. Nearly half a billion women and girls are illiterate. I can't even believe we're talking about illiteracy still. And less than half of rural girls actually go on to secondary school. So there's still a lot of work to do in education. Now onto more bleak topics, politics. When we talk about politics and power and leadership and decision-making, this is where inequality is most visible because actually women are rendered virtually invisible. I mean, look around, you can see, this is the widest gap, political participation. We see too few women leaders, and even when we do, they are touted as the exception and the first, and they're not the norm at all. Women serve as heads of state or government in 20-some uh, countries, now maybe 23 with Tanzania, um, and almost 120 countries have never had a woman leader ever. I mean, even with the new president of Tanzania, Samia Suluhu, who, when she was sworn into office, here is what the articles in the paper said. She was sworn into office wearing, gosh, sorry, New York, it's loud. I'm sure you all are hearing the sirens, but I think this adds to the ambiance. Um, anyway, uh, the articles said that she was sworn into office wearing a red jacket and a scarf or whatever. I mean, she's the president. What does it matter what she was wearing? There is no case in the world where a man who was sworn into office is, to, is written up as saying, well, I'm sworn into office wearing a tweed jacket and a blue tie. We, you know, it sounds ridiculous. So you can see how the ways we even refer to women in politics and leadership, heads of state, um, let's talk about the one thing that actually pains me the most, which is violence and discrimination. We are talking about countries that still have discriminatory laws. So legislation that actively discriminates against women and 2.5 billion, 2.5 billion women are still living in countries that have discrimination embedded in their legislation. So for instance, in about a hundred countries, there are laws that still restrict the type of work that women can and can't do and needing permission from husbands in order to pursue certain types of work. I mean, it's unbelievable. And this is codified, this is in the law. When we talk about violence against women, this is the one that hurts me the most. Because the statistic is that one in three women and girls will experience some form of violence in their lifetime. One in three. And that probably underestimates the reality. I mean, it is just outrageous. Um, 81% of women have experienced some form of sexual harassment, verbal or physical. Child marriage still happens too often, just about everywhere. We've got 15 million girls married before the age of 18 every year, 15 million every year. 
And one interesting example, you know, I, I recently came across this and now I sort of started to talk about it. And when we talk about discrimination, it's not just these like horrible things that happen over there, you know, elsewhere, whatever. No, I mean, here's a weird one that affects all of us. And these all affect all of us. So for me, what I try and do is, is um, fight back on this urge that everybody has to other the violence, to say, oh, well, that's, you know, that's other people, that's over there, that's this country, that's this culture. No, no, it's everywhere. So here is one that brings it home very strangely. Uh, women are almost 50% more likely to suffer injuries in car crashes. I thought that's really weird. Why? I, I did I, that one. I didn't know. I only recently came across that. And that's because safety features for cars are designed by men and for men. So they're designed with men's bodies and men's physique in mind. So you can imagine women are completely left out of that. And so they suffer more severe injuries as a result. It's baffling. Um, in the economy, women's unemployment is higher than men's. This is not a surprise. 62% um, of women are in the labor force compared to 90 plus uh, percent of men. Uh, two thirds of low wage workers are women. This is not a surprise either. And they are in the informal economy. They are earning lower wages. They have greater risk. They have less protection and so on. And now with COVID, this is even worse. Um, women do the majority of unpaid work, not a surprise. Um, women spend somewhere between two to 10 hours more a day uh, caring for children, the elderly, the sick, whatever. Again, add, that's pre-COVID. So add the COVID context onto that and you can imagine. And when women do paid work, they earn far less than men in every occupation, everywhere. The wage gap is real. It is not a myth. Um, if it were to close, the world GDP would grow by $12 trillion over the next 10 or 12 years. $12 trillion, I don't even know how many zeros that has. That's astronomical. Uh, women are less likely to access any financial services. Um, women in the workplace suffer rampant discrimination, sexual harassment, et cetera. Um, if you replace a female name on a CV with a male name, uh, the chance of being hired improves by 60%. Shocking. Same person, different name. Same CV. Different name, male, female, 60% greater chance of being hired. And research shows also that women are about 80%, 80% less likely to be hired if they have children. That's because women with children are treated worse in the workplace. They per they're perceived as unreliable, unprofessional. Oh, they're gonna, they've got kids. That's their priority. They're not uh, committed to the workplace. While men with children are treated better at work. And that is because they've activated their provider role. They have family responsibilities. It makes them more respectable. So you see these double standards. And then there's the issue of intersectionality. I think we all know what that means, but it makes these challenges even greater. The idea that women also face bias as women, but in addition to that, it's compounded due to race, class, sexual orientation, orientation religion, ethnicity, disability, whatever, all sorts of other identity markers. Uh, and so the intersection of all of these makes a bad situation a lot worse. So let's take that to the Arab region where we've got the widest gender gap, 153 years to close. No Arab country is even in the top 100, not a single one. For instance, a country like Lebanon is 145th. Literacy rates are extremely, um, are, are not as high as we'd like, about 60 some percent for women, 80% for men. Um, women's participation in the workforce in the Arab region is less than 20%, that is the world's lowest. And then we've got the most uh, countries that have um, high rates of depression for women. So again, um, really bleak kind of, uh, challenges, really difficult to overcome, many protracted crises and insecurities, you know, add to those layers. So it's really tough to be able to drive forward change and to do it in a way that is meaningful and to do it in my lifetime, which again is my goal. If you look at a country like Lebanon that is facing all of these kinds of circumstances, the crises and, and inequality and a repeated government collapse and now economic collapse, total devaluation of the currency, uh, add COVID onto that, already a patriarchal context, um, discrimination embedded in the law, personal status codes that determine what you can and can't do as a woman and you know what rights you have to your own body, none. Um, all of those kinds of things and the blast that happened that destroyed a big portion of Beirut all of that means that the so-called women's agenda is constantly pushed to the side. 
made even more worse by um, any types of, of other identities that you might have. If you are a queer woman, migrant, refugee, a woman living with disabilities, um, a female domestic worker, whatever else, uh, the situation is very dire. So unfortunately, Lebanon is one of the worst. I said it was um, 145th in terms of the global gender gap. I didn't mention that's out of 153 countries. So we are talking about Lebanon being really at the bottom of the barrel. Some of the worst and lowest rates of labor market participation, representation in politics and decision making and leadership, all of those things um, that have now been magnified as a result of, in the last one year, um, public protests and civil unrest, uh, government collapse, restructure, failures, et cetera, um, the Beirut blast, COVID, the economy, and so on. So what happens in those kinds of contexts? Having worked in many emergency settings, I can tell you that women's rights and freedoms are always the first to go and the last to return if they ever come back. So even before all of these things, women were driven to levels of poverty that caused them to resort to very risky measures for their survival, uh, making them more vulnerable to things like sexual exploitation and abuse, uh, and things now, imagine the situation that is so severe with this total devaluation of the currency. Now the Lebanese lira is nearly worthless. Um, so things like sex for food, sex for rent, sex for supplies, trafficking, all of this is increasing. The homelessness that is caused by the blast, by poverty, by insecurity, by all of that um, is forcing people into makeshift housing, temporary shelters, unsafe spaces that lack water, that lack um, lighting that lack toilets, all of those things increase risks and women and girls face specific risks of sexual violence in those settings. Um, overcrowding, being forced to live next to men that you don't know, not having safe, lit, lockable spaces. Women at work, first to be fired, last to be rehired. Um, it will be very hard for women to enter or re-enter the workforce unless it's the informal economy. And again, that lacks risks, lack, that, sorry, lacks protections and increases risks. And, the, and women's burden of unpaid care is going to increase again and again and again. And when it comes to education for girls, um, girls are the first to be pulled out of school if they're needed at home, if the family economic situation is severe. And as a result, also child marriage will increase. And all of this is happening already. These aren't my doomsday predictions. This is actually true. Child marriage increases in all of these contexts. This is not just Lebanon as an effort to reduce the economic burden on the family, offloading the girls, and also kind of perversely as a way to protect them because when they are in those kinds of situations of insecurity and sexual violence increases, they fear that something will happen to the girls. So to protect their honor, it is better to marry them off, namely while they're still virgins. So you can imagine these situations and what happens when you take a girl out of school, you marry her off early um, in terms of her education, her employment, her physical health, her body isn't ready uh, to, to have any sexual relationships, to bear children, on and on and on. This is not just damaging the girl's life, but damaging generations. Um, and again, you know, for all forms of violence against women will increase. And I see this in every single emergency. And now with the COVID pandemic, we have seen it in terms of the increase in intimate partner violence, not just Lebanon, not just the Arab region, the world. So what can we actually do about this? You know, we keep saying that uh, women are the face and the force of recovery and of resilience. Well, you know, I hate this word resilience. And that's because it places the onus on women themselves. Oh, you're resilient, it's okay, tough it up. You don't wanna be resilient unless you absolutely have to be. We shouldn't be putting people in these circumstances where they are struggling day to day for their own survival. And we know from research, from evidence, from life, from logic that any country or community's best chance of peace and prosperity and progress isn't based on the government, isn't based on the type of economy, it's how the country treats its women. So when we come to understand that, we think, okay, well, what does that mean for us in the US? I mean, now that again, I don't want us to other this, I want us to see this as our problem because it's everywhere. In the US, um, the US isn't even in the top 10 countries in terms of gender equality. It's not even in the top 50 countries. The US is 53rd out of 153 countries in terms of its gender gap. And the year before it was 51, meaning we're getting worse. 
And that's here, that's in the States, that's you, your friends, your neighbors. When I say things like one in three women and girls, I don't mean one in three over there. I mean one in three also right here. Um, in the US, we know that one in 16 girls say that their first sexual experience was forced. That means rape. I mean, this is happening all the time, all around us, you know, and we assume that our, our systems are fair and our system of justice is just and security protects everybody. And in the economy, we have um, uh, meritocracy in the workplace. No, the system is not fair. The system has actively discriminated against women and girls. And we have to acknowledge that that exists so we can proactively fix it. Like I said, we cannot fix what we cannot see. And for all of us as individuals, you know, this isn't about the government or the UN or, or, or NGOs or charitable organizations that are fixing the problem. It is about all of us and our behavior and what we do and what we say and how we live our lives. Uh, when I gave my TEDx talk, which was now many years ago, um, people had always asked me, what can I do and how do I get involved? And I, you know, I don't want to move to Afghanistan like you did. I don't want to live on the front lines of a war. I, I just want to be able to do the right thing. And I said, well, you need to start where you stand. And that was the kind of tagline of my talk, this idea that if you take responsibility for your space and your life and your circle and your community, your friends and your family and whoever, it is going to have a massive spillover effect. I mean, this kind of behavior is contagious and any behavior is contagious. So you might as well make it good is what I think. And in the end, this is a no brainer. You know, I'd like to say it's common sense, but you know, the world has proven that common sense is actually not all that common. But what it is, is about dignity and respect. And those are not difficult concepts to grasp. And that is something that we all need, we all deserve, and we are all inherently born with. So you know, in the end, this is not at all a complicated concept. So I tell people, you know, everywhere you go, in every space that you occupy, your family or your workplace or, or the market or whatever, ask yourself who's here and who's not here. So you understand who is left out. Ask yourself who's doing the talking, who's doing the deciding and what that means. And then you start to question those things and you think, okay, you know, maybe we do need to have diverse voices represented because we're all implicated in this. I mean, diverse groups uh, design better solutions for our lives, right? Think of car crashes. So, you know, how do you change yourself and how do you change the rules and how do you um, change yourself as an individual and also, and also fight uh, the system and reform the institutions because this is a institutionalized inequality and it has to change. You know, back to this idea of International Women's Day and acknowledging um, what this means and what this month means and why we should talk about it. You know, I recently wrote an article that was called I Hate International Women's Day. And I do because International Women's Day for me is every day. And so I said, all right, Nina, think like, if this is my everyday thing, and it is, and I started when I was quite young, actually. Um, I started when I was 14, it's a whole other story. But you know, I'm a little bit older than that now, but my concrete work experience is about 25 years in this field. So if I've had International Women's Day, 365 days a year for 25 years, that's 9,125 International Women's Days. And I'm constantly asking myself, what can I do? What can I do more? What can I do better? How can I drive change forward faster? You know, and we keep coming up with great arguments for this. Like we talk about gender parity and the positive impacts that it'll have on all aspects of our lives, economic and social and political and whatever. We say that equality results in higher GDP. You've heard that argument and more productivity. Great. We talk about more women leaders uh, bringing better performance. Okay. Uh, that's in business, certainly. More women political leaders bring more prosperity to countries. Great. You know, all of these arguments you've heard before, they're all very strong. And so I asked myself in my 9,000 days of doing this work, which is the one, is, which is the, the argument that is going to compel people? When, is the, when are we going to have our collective aha moment and say, now we need to take action? Is it the argument for productivity or performance or prosperity? You know, I, for me, it is an argument in favor of principle. The status quo is simply not good enough. And there is a, we know that this is the right thing to do and we know that this is the time to do it. In fact, it is long overdue. I personally am not willing to wait these 100 years. So how do we really change the narrative and, and make this world a better, more livable place for all of us? It's not as simple as just adding women in because presence doesn't necessarily mean power. So we really need to rethink what we're talking about when we share this space, because it is about all of us. 
It is about our lives. It is about the structures that serve us. Um, and they do need to serve all of us, right? We cannot assume that nothing is going to change all because it hasn't really changed yet. I mean, if I didn't believe in change, I think I wouldn't be able to do this kind of work, even though I, I must admit I am extremely impatient. Um, so as I said, I guess I'll, um, I'll end a little bit where I started and start where you stand, because once you look around and see the changes that need to be made and you make those changes, you're already building a better world for everyone. Thank you very much. I'll stop there. Uh, I could go on, but I'd love to take some questions and have time for a discussion. Terrific. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to defer now to, to you as Lena, as you've told me to call you many times. Um, but I, I wanted to, to start the conversation here with uh, getting into the personal side. So you, you've, you've touched on it a little bit. Um, I didn't realize that your work started when you were uh, 14, which is wonderful to hear because our work at the council is very much about youth leadership and, um, and hearing youth voices, but authentic, meaningful, real leadership. So um, why don't you just uh, share a little bit more with us around how this work is personal to you? Well, it, it's a factor of so many different things. Um, I love this question, actually, because people ask, like, how, well, how did you start? The thing is, I mean, I'm Lebanese and Palestinian. I was born in Beirut just before the Civil War. We packed up and left, moved to Saudi Arabia, then moved to the States. So already there's like lots of hyphenated background coming into this. Uh, my parents are of different religions. Um, they had a quite revolutionary civil marriage. So I grew up not taking anything for granted, no aspect of my identity. Everything had to be unpacked and explained to me all the time. Well, you're this, but you're this, but you're this and you're this and you're this and you're that. And so I also learned how to ask a lot of questions. Um, and by the time I came to the States, I was about 10, I would already asked a fair bit of questions about, um, about who we were and what we could do and couldn't do and women's rights and roles and responsibilities and all of that. And this mixed background that I brought into it and my childhood in Saudi Arabia and com coming to the States at the time I did, it all kind of crystallized for me when I was 14. I was in a high school class called Comparative Women's History. And I thought, all right, I, you know, this is, there is something that compels me here. I don't really know what is calling me to this class. And it wasn't about women's history in the end because it was about the history of violence against women. And I was mortified. What we saw and heard and learned was how you do foot binding, um, what female genital mutilation looks like and seeing videos, um, bridal burning, breaking your ribs to fit into a corset, breast augmentation, intimate partner violence. I was 14, I was absolutely traumatized. Uh, and I, that, that's the class, the old, probably the only class that kept me up at night because I wanted to stay up and not because I had to. And I never ever did anything else. I mean, it opened my eyes in a way that was so disturbing and I committed to doing something about it. And I tried volunteering and I tried all types of things. Um, and it took me a while, you know, and I think I'm still trying 30 some years later, but uh, that was it. That was the issue that uh, I felt like I had a duty to do something and I couldn't ever let it go. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm just, again, speaks to the power that it's it's never, never too young or too late to start. I really, really, loved your message and this uh start where you stand is 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 so beautiful um so thank you for for sharing that and giving a more context on a personalized lens we have some questions coming in uh so i just want to encourage our audience keep them coming whether you're joining us on Wonderful. facebook through the comments or uh in the zoom room on uh the q a or the chat um one question here we have from leticia what do you think of the role of education in lifting countries out of poverty and empowering women? Do you favor the involvement of the adjusted states in this use through acts such as the Malala Yousafzai uh, Scholarship Act? Um, okay, I can speak to education in general and absolutely. I mean, there's, I wanna say there's no magic bullet, right? We really wanna find the one thing, it's education, it's legislative reform, it's this, it's that, it's all of those things. So, I mean, I've got to preface everything by saying that, that it's not going to be just one answer, but education is critical. Um, I think you heard in my presentation, when you deprive girls of an education, it's not just the girl's life you're destroying, it is 
her her family and her health and her her financial future and all of those things. So it's got a massive spillover effect. So how do you make sure that education is available, accessible, safe? Also, what kind of education? You know, it's not just sitting in any classroom. It is the quality of education. Are we conveying the right message? to girls about what they what they can do and what they can be and what they can achieve you know the setting also makes a big difference are girls safe in the classroom uh, you'd be surprised how many times there are cases of sexual exploitation you know male teachers and i mean this is the kind of one of the oldest stories in the world but you know what is the point of an education if you are not even safe in getting there and being there and staying there in the classroom you know if there are lots of factors involved and then can she put that education to use right what can she do afterwards what is the incentive for families to say yes it's worthwhile to educate girls so there needs to be a lot of of change of um uh, how people view education, how people view women's rights and roles, et cetera, starting from a very young age, you know, and if you embed some messages like equality and nonviolence and consent and bodily integrity and autonomy into education, these are the things that serve you forever and ever. But we are constantly surprised by how discriminatory education is in terms of the texts and what we learn and what we hear and the messages we absorb and the experiences we have. So yes for education and it better be good. Thanks for that. Um, another question that's coming in on, on the case of, of, you know, what can we do? A lot of what we talk about in the council is also how we're making the work issues that are happening in the world relevant to Pittsburgh, right? So how do you see yourself in this, this, this big world out there? And I, I again, very much appreciate it when you said, um, I don't mean one in three over there. I mean one in three right here. So mm -hmm. centering us in our in our right here in the the starting where we stand, we have this question around around men and what role men can play in the fight for women's rights globally. How can men fight against toxic masculinity in their own lives and best support women in the struggle? And I believe you've written on yes. on toxic masculinity. Beautiful. I love this. Uh, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to be uh, active bystanders, to be proactive, to do the right thing, to say the right thing, to model the right behavior, to stand up and speak out. It's scary, uh, but it's necessary, right? And that means being an ally, being a champion, being a supporter, recognizing, like I said, who's in the room, who's not here, who's speaking, who's deciding, and what you can do about that. Pass the mic, right? It's not that you know women don't have a voice. No, they have a voice. They just don't have the microphone. So pass it, share, pay attention, listen to what's being said. Um, there are in the workplace, for instance, I know there are great apps. Unfortunately, none of us ever convene face to face anymore. So I can't put these to the test, but uh, apps like uh, Gender Timer or what Woman Interrupter or whatever they're called, I can't remember the exact names, but assessing in a, in a concrete way through an app, so it's honest, who is doing the speaking, who's doing the interrupting, and you can see that it is not equal even in the workplace. So to whatever extent that we can say, you know what, let her speak, I think is, is critical. Um, you know, you hear all of these things that come up like women, politicians and whoever who say, you know what, I, I'm speaking. <laughs> shut up <laughs> but we you know we don't shouldn't all have to say that we should be able to create the space and give each other the respect um and honor each other's ideas and thoughts and so you know what can men do they can do a lot of things stop excusing the locker room talk and the boys will be boys kind of crap i mean this is you know we have we are decades we are generations past that what do you do at home what do you do in the workplace what do you do in public space how do you speak to your children as a man, you do not need to have a mother or a daughter or a wife or you know a, a, a female a canine in order to empathize with women. You just have to be a good human and understand that this is a human rights issue. You know, the, the amount of times that we say, oh, but your sister, your mother, no, did you need to actually have a woman that is directly associated with you for you to finally realize? No, these are not ways that we treat each other as humans. It is part of what makes us inherently human that we are all worthy of the same dignity and rights and respect. So uh, recognizing that and not kind of connecting it to women close to you, I think is a very helpful thing that all women are entitled to this even if they're not related to you. Uh, how do you be that, be that guy? You know, it's tough, but I think that 
when we talk about something like, let's say sexual harassment, you know, the, it is a fact that the vast majority of perpetrators are men and boys and the vast majority of victim survivor are women and girls. So this is an undisputed fact, but I'm not gonna say that every guy is a perpetrator, not at all. In fact, there are so many who recognize that this is wrong and recognize that this is behavior that is um, uh, violent and making women uncomfortable and dangerous and harmful and illegal in some places and so on. But how do you speak up? How do you have the courage to say, you know what, enough. But I think those are very powerful moments. And the more that guys, even at a young age, speak out and find their courage and their voice and the language to stand up and say, this isn't right. You know, that, like I said, that behavior is contagious. Um, and I think, like I said, it's not easy, but it is so necessary and it really will have a huge spillover effect. It'll make a massive difference. Yeah, and incredibly important that these are um, important to remember that these are not partisan issues. These are human rights. Thank you for, for adding to that. We have a few more questions that are coming in. Again, please keep them coming. I'm looking over here to our Facebook uh, stream and we have a question from Don who says, thank you, Dr. Abi Rafi. Can you speak to a moment or two when you, while working within NGO, NFP and educational systems that often perpetuate the institu institutionalization of violence they purport to challenge, were able to succeed in shifting the system towards self-reflexivity, apology, healing, and harm reduction. <laughs> so I have to concretely think of incidents where we've shifted into into concrete <laughs> healing, and well, that's maybe difficult. some big picture on how to how to dismantle or challenge these. Um, yeah, these I mean, you know, we talk about we talk about Me Too stuff. Uh, and Me Too caught on worldwide, you know, not just in the Western world, but everywhere, because it is so true, because we don't even realize the extent to which these things are pervasive. And has, has that led to a massive healing and a collective, you know, a sense of responsibility? Very, very little. Um, I came from a culture, like I said, where I was doing humanitarian aid work. And that is a really kind of cowboy, cavalier sort of culture. Like if you're not tough enough, you know, you shouldn't be in the field. You should get a job in, in headquarters, go to Geneva, you'll be safe there. You know, that kind of attitude. Um, so it is very difficult to address those kinds of issues without uh, losing traction professionally or seen as less credible. So, you know, very often these are the things that are not shared. So I don't, I can't even tell you the grand aha moments because they, they are very, very seldom. Like I said, when there are gigantic global campaigns and, you know, social media avalanches, um, there are still very few people who are held to account. Right. If we are talking about millions, how many millions of women me too, and how many perpetrators were uh, held accountable. You, know, there, you can compare those numbers. I wish I had them on hand because it is shocking. So, you know, for me, I've, I've experienced that kind of discrimination. I have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace. And I've been told, oh, Lena, that's just what it's like being a woman in this line of work. And, you know, no one's going to confess to it. And so there's no point in, in pointing fingers. And it really is just going to breed discomfort in the workplace. And, you know, why don't you just all try and get along? You know, it's always my responsibility. And we still do those things. And we still say those things. And you can look at you know, the justice system and the way it treats women who come forward seeking uh, access to justice for cases of sexual violence. What happens to them? Their entire lives are dug up and everything they ever said or did or wore or drank or ate is suddenly subject to public scrutiny and everybody's on the jury there, right? So when we talk about these types of things, there aren't a lot of reconciliation, grand moments and you know warm, fuzzy feelings because women don't even wanna come forward until there is a sense that the system is fair and it is going to hold perpetrators to account you know, we live in a culture of next to total impunity on these kinds of things. So I think, you know, I wish I had happy stories for you, but we have a lot of work to do. I think that's the reality. What about the next question that's come in has to do with social media and Bridget is asking, do you feel that the rise of social media campaigns have had a positive impact on increasing awareness and taking action on women's rights issues in the Arab region? Absolutely. Although the Arab region is um, not as connected, right? I mean, there are parts of the world, there are pockets. We assume that everybody's online. Well, no, not everybody's online. 
So, you know, the challenge is social media has got a lot of power, but also, and this is global, it also presents new risks, right? We've experienced new forms of violence. You say things behind your, the safety of your screen to other people that you would not say in real life. It has been, um, it has increased some form of violence. There is cyberbullying and harassment and rape threats and all types of things that are shockingly pervasive. You know, online harassment is actually not a joke because first of all, it is scary and is real and sometimes it manifests in real life. But in the Arab region, you know, I remember in the beginning of the Me Too movement, and we're still in the Me Too moment, we will be forever. Uh, I was asked, you know, where's the Arab Me Too? And I said, well, first of all, we've been whispering Me Too to each other for generations. All because we're not posting it doesn't mean it's not happening. Number one. Number two, when you post publicly and when you use social media, you have to be sure that the benefit of that outweighs the costs for you, right? You, If I'm going to say, Lena, Me Too, I better be sure that I'm going to be protected, uh, at least respected, acknowledged, believed, uh, not discriminated against, not uh, further stigmatized, ostracized, whatever, not re-victimized. And that's not true in many countries, right? You could uh, lose your sense of, of community, uh, family, you lose your job, you know, it goes on and on. So you better be sure, or at least the system had better be sure that you can say those things freely and safely. And that's not the case. Um, there were indigenous uh, movements that are that were Arab kind of spins on Me Too, and I thought they were excellent. There was Mosque Me Too, which is the Muslim community. There was Mish um, Basita, uh, which means it's not okay in Arabic, that was like uh, against sexual harassment. Uh, there were several others and they, they had pockets of activity and I thought that was great. Um, did we have a massive movement? No, I think we're still coming, coming into that. But at the same time, we need to be sure that there is a, a benefit to doing it. There is certainly the solidarity, the global solidarity, sharing this idea that, wait a minute, it's all of us, it's everywhere, it's all the time. We're not othering this, we're not alone, it's not our fault. Those are the kinds of messages that social media can help spread because then you realize, oh my goodness, wait, you know, what happened to me yesterday or last year or 20 years ago was um, something that has been experienced by so many women and girls. And, you know, I blamed myself and I've changed my life as a result. And actually it wasn't me at all. It's always the perpetrator. You know, you come to terms with those kinds of things and there is a, a therapeutic element to that. There is a, a connection to a larger community based on a shared experience, a terrible shared experience. Uh, but we need to make sure the systems and the services are set up so that we are able to prevent and respond in a better way. Legal, justice, security, uh, the medical system, all of that, that they all work together and speak to each other and agree that this is a crime. We've got to prevent it. We've got protocols in place to respond to it. And until we have all of that, um, I don't think that women and girls would be safe. So social media is a, a lovely thing, but also a scary thing. Mm -hmm. One of um, our audience members uh, reflects on how we talk about the U.S. as as being more advanced and lifting up women, but how how much has it truly evolved in eradicating misogyny? And uh, a lot they, to quote this person, uh, Adaran. Uh, a lot is still painful to watch and reminds me of the so-called less developed countries. So this question of privilege being at play. Would you like to speak to that? I don't make the distinction between less developed and developed and first and third world and whatever kind of things that we used to say. I don't really, buy. when it comes to treating women, uh, when it comes to, to equality, we're all in the same boat and it's a pretty bad boat. So you heard what I said that the US isn't even in the top 50, not even the top 50. So this delusion of the US doing so well is one thing that we need to actively shatter. Uh, women don't have rights to their own bodies and lives. We're still discussing, um, uh, abortion rights, we're still talking about contraception, we're still talking about why the world can access Viagra more than, than uh, the pill, we're still talking about women's health that is stigmatized, we're still talking about the wage gap, we're still, I mean, honestly, we are not doing well at all. And now we have our first, our very first female vice president, very first, I mean, it, is it is it the 1850s or is it 2021? Like, I, honestly, and everybody's like, wow, that's great. I'm like, really? That's a hundred years late. I, I, I don't want to poo-poo the party, but honestly, I mean, these are, are minute microscopic achievements. This is not good enough and we all know it. And none of this like, oh ladies, but look, 77 cents of the dollar is not bad. No, 
that is terrible. And that's 77 cents for white women. So imagine, right? Let's keep adding layers and layers and layers onto this. The reality is that we are living in a world that is unequal and the US is no exception. And what is dangerous is when we start to think that we are better because then we stop examining and, and criticizing and we stop paying attention and we think the system is fine, the system is fair, the country's got the right laws in place. Do you know that child marriages are still legal in Florida? Like if a parent says that the daughter can get married at age 12, like she will, do we even know that that's true? You know, that's true. Um, so there are all sorts of things in place that remind us that this is embedded and institutionalized and it's in our culture and it's everywhere. Uh, it's in our media, it's in our messages and it's in our minds. So yesterday I received keep working 100 years. So much work, so much work. Yesterday I came across a, a quote uh, on how when better is expected, good is not enough. And that's what I'm hearing from you loud and clearly. Ooh the better that is expected and needed and, and the urgency of it. We have one more question from the audience uh, that um, I wanted to make sure we got to, which is what, from Jim, what does the future hold for women in Afghanistan? Oh gosh. <laughs> I spent four years in Afghanistan. Did I mention that? I don't know how Jim knew that, but <laughs> I don't know if I said it. So I spent four years in Afghanistan. It, physically living there, but also many years working on it. And I just, I, I think it is a fascinating place, a beautiful country uh, that has persevered through some extraordinary circumstances and the women and the men are incredible, really incredible, strong people. I'm not gonna say resilient because you know, that's one of those buzzwords, but you know, what does the future hold? The women are, have been fighting this for, for decades, forever. Um, and they are resourceful and they are relentless. And I love that. Uh, what I think what the future holds is impossible to predict, but, you know, we're moving in the right direction. I can tell you one story that is, you know, maybe a marginally happy story. One of the last things I did in Afghanistan in 2005 and six was work on the parliamentary elections. And at that point, we had done all this advocacy for quota. We had 25% quota in place. And so everybody was like, what? Women in parliament, you know, what, what's going to happen here? It's going to disrupt the balance, destroy the patriarchy, you know, undermine like one of the last bastions of male dominance, anyway, it was, there was a lot of angst around this. Um, and on the part of the women as well, and fear and threats and, and violence and all sorts of things. Um, so anyway, 25% of women in parliament and we got that and we got the women in and you know they started to kind of uh, come into their own politically, which was fantastic. And the men started to get used to it and the world was watching this. Many years later, I was in um, South Africa, I think for a conference and I we were all, landing at the airport at similar times, these different uh, delegates and being picked up. And one woman said to me, this is in the ba in baggage claim in maybe Cape Town. I can't remember where it was. And she said, you're Lena in Afghanistan. I said, yes, you know, <laughs> that will be me. And she said, you don't remember me, but I'm a member of parliament. I remember the Afghan parliament. She said, you brought me in and helped me out in 2005 and six. And we were 25% women according to the quota. And now we're 28% women in parliament. And that means that women got in on their own merit. So not only did people get used to the idea that women have political agency and voice and are, are inherent political actors, just like any being, um, but that women were elected above the quota. So I thought that's fantastic. You know, that is the way that that's, that's how we're gonna eventually level the playing field. We're gonna have to kick it forward a little bit we're going to have to create these temporary positive discriminations in order to uh, rectify what is a historic imbalance. We cannot say the system will take care of itself because, again, 100 years, it's like riding a Galapagos turtle. It's not going to really get us very, you know, I love turtles, not going to get us very far. Um, so having said that, you know, that is one example of the quota having done its job. People got used to it. People liked it. Uh, women came in on their own right, as they rightly should. So Afghanistan, I'm, uh, I'm watching you and I'm cheering for you. Thank you so much, Lena. We have had such great feedback there. We're getting cheers, virtual cheers from the audience as well. Everything that you're saying is resonating so, so powerfully. It's really just, again, an honor to have um, had this time with you here today. 
Um, for our audience members, um, again, please join me in a virtual applause, uh, thanking Lena for this wonderful time together. We are going to drop in a survey um, in our chat as well as in uh, Facebook. And please give us your feedback. This is what helps us make sure that we are creating programs that matter to you. Um, if you want to connect with Lena um, and, and keep building on this important and her important story and work, um, she is sharing her message around the world. So you can reach out to her as well if you want to engage her for uh, future speaking engagements. We didn't even get into the work that you've been doing lately on unconscious bias. Uh, oh. But again, a wealth of knowledge. Uh, we'll put her contact information as well in all of our follow-up. Um, but her email is uh, lena.abirafi at lau.edu. I want to also and thank- Social media is my first and last name. It's so easy. Perfect. Uh, I also want to thank Sumu for her incredible performance and, and courage to share her story, to share her voice, and to keep doing that and keep leading. Uh, thank you to our partners at the Gender Equity Commission of the City of Pittsburgh, the Women and Girls Foundation, and the American Middle East Institute. Uh, today's program was recorded, and all attendees are going to receive an email link with the recording. Uh, it's also going to be available again on, face, on Facebook and uh, YouTube. Um, and if you enjoyed today's virtual program, please consider making a donation to support the council and uh, help us further our mission and continue doing this important work. It takes all of us. Thank you so much, Lena. And again, thank you. Really appreciate your time. Take good care, Anytime. everyone. Thank you.